again, everyone, um, for being here. I'm very excited. I think of um, all the technologies I've seen of the three decades I've been in IT. Node's grown amazing. It's just been a, an amazing ride. Um, just, I'm kind of curious. How many of you are, are JavaScript, know JavaScript pretty well? Most everyone, excellent. How about, how many of you have actually dabbled in Node.js at this point and played with it? Good, okay. So we've got our bases covered. We've got everything from kind of the beginner topics all the way to the guys creating this, the Node packages up there on um, the Node Package Manager site. So I think we're going to have our bases covered. Um, the way I want to gear the night is mostly code-based, fast-paced. Everything I've talked about is on, is on my blog. Uh, so if you look over here, you'll notice that um, I've got this little section. Boy, the network's slow. I wonder why. <laughs> right here, I've got um, all my posts on everything I'll talk about and more. So if you're interested, um, feel free to indulge. So I'm going to give you like a one-slide intro to Node in a nutshell. Um, you all are familiar with uh, Java being in the browser, JavaScript that is. Well, the world has now moved this into the server side as well. This is all made possible by the Google V8 engine, which drives, the, uh, which drives this uh, technology. So again, it's JavaScript on the server. So all you client guys are now server developers. I'm kind of in disbelief. I always thought you needed a compiled language on the server. But apparently, um, Node's doing really good. You know, Facebook uses it. Yahoo uses it. Um, these gentlemen probably know of some other sites that are using it. So I think uh, you're going to see quite a bit of uh, stuff. So I think when I, when I look at Node, when I see all the, the stuff around it, it's all about this notion of concurrency. It does concurrency very, very well. And I'll explain a little more a bit, bit about that. Essentially, you're never waiting. There's always vacancy. Um, there's always a request possible by the Node engine. So whether there's a database or a web service in the back end, typically it'll take on more and more connections. So there's been a lot of research about how many connections, and that's really how data centers measure their productivity. How many connections can you support on a single box? And Node is one of those technologies that uh, scales super, super well. Um, this was recorded two years ago. It's got 200,000 views on YouTube, um, and it was Max, the, the videographer tonight, did this two years ago. So I would suggest to go look at this as well after tonight. This is the creator of Node. It's about an hour long. The demo that I show you tonight is kind of leveraging some of that. So this would be a good next step for you guys uh, as we move forward. So with that said, let's just jump into the typical little hello world. So I'm going to use my favorite editor here, um, VI, and I'm going to say hello. Fire this guy up, and I'm going to start kind of building this guy incrementally. So when you look at the require statement here, this is basically saying I want to use the HTTP library. And over time, as you use Node, you'll install more and more libraries. And I believe Michael's going to talk about this at the end of the night. I do have a deck on this. How do you install these other packages? So one of the things that you're going to do after something like this is um, create the callback. So when someone comes and hits your site, this create server gets called. And you'll notice here the two parameters, um, request and response, over here to the right. Actually, I've got my little draw tool, these guys. So there's your request and response objects. And with those, you can read parameters. You can write to the back to the browser um, or whatever HTTP clients you have. So let's go ahead and put the body into this guy, and it's going to be your typical hello world. So you can see here that there's different, uh, we're writing the, the header content type here. So this could be you know, RSS, this could be a video tag, whatever it is you're writing back. And here you can see I'm just sending the word hello world. Now we just got to set up the listener here at the very bottom. And this is basically saying on, on port 1337 on my local host, I'm going to listen to this guy. So we can save this guy and run him. Go back to my command prompt. And I think this should look familiar to, both, to most of you. So go ahead and it's waiting for me. Now I'm going to fire up a browser page to go to this. There you go. So you can see here that indeed, hello world got sent. Notice, by the way, I did pass parameters here. If you look over here in the upper right, you can see the zip code. I'll use that in maybe a future demo. but. 
you could have read that as well and reacted appropriately. So that's your basic hello world. Nothing too fancy. I think it gets the point across of what you can do with Node and how simple the syntax is. Um, let's jump into uh, another topic over here. Let me close this browser session. So Node is kind of bad at certain types of things, and one of them is multi-threaded type of operations. And in fact, that's the, one of the main benefits of Node. You don't wor worry about semaphores and mutexes and signals and threads. It just naturally does that for you on I.O. bound operations. Now, some of the gentlemen might talk to you later tonight about how you can kind of work around that. There is um, some stuff here you can find on the net. Here's one such uh, site where the guy, uh, not this site, another site, uh, let's see, it's this site right here, where he gets into how you can leverage the next tick to do kind of multi-thready kind of things. We're not going to, I'm not going to get into that tonight, but inherently it's not that, it's single-threaded. Now what it is good at is I.O. So it's got screaming excellent I.O. performance. That's the one area where it really, really shines. And so that's the primary driver, I think, for most people. They're, they're kind of I.O. bound. We're seeing a lot of traction, and I'm curious in this group, um, people reading MongoDB, which of course returns things in JSON format, and, and, and uh, Node being a JavaScript language loves JSON. How many of you are doing MongoDB and Node together? Wow, good. Uh, not that many as I would have expected. So at any rate, that's, uh, I think that's a very promising technology right there. One more thing I might want to mention uh, here. Oh, that's the wrong one. I want to say no, say hello one more time. I'm already running this guy on another window, I believe. Yep. So I wanted to bring up Fiddler really quick. Fiddler is a proxy, kind of lets you look at what's happening kind of behind the scenes. So if we go and uh, do another uh, browse to this session, you'll notice that Fiddler recorded that. And the part I wanted to focus on briefly is this bottom part here, the header. So if you notice these uh, parameters over here, let's talk a little bit about these parameters, these, this header, if you will. So this header has essentially got these different sections. So the first one is that we're using the latest HTTP protocol. And this keep alive is one of the secrets. It allows us to keep a kind of more connections open and not have to open and close them all the time. That's given us some good performance. And this last part basically says that the server doesn't have to say how much output it's going to provide the client. It's basically going to be chunked on a demand basis. So this is, if you watch the Ryan Dahl video, he focuses on this a little bit. So just kind of heads up for that. So let's uh, keep rolling with this guy. Um, I've got another couple quick examples to show you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the following. So Node does both of these, HTTP and TCP. I just showed you HTTP. I want to show you is TCP. Now, you're requiring different libraries for that, obviously, and that's why you'll see um, HTTP versus NET. Now, most of you know the differences between these two protocols. Some of them consider TCP more, more efficient. After all, HTTP uses TCP. But then there are challenges with TCP in terms of firewalls and so on. Now, I'm not going to have time to show this full diagram, but what I want to do as my final kind of demo here is build out this lame chat server that does TCP-based kind of chat application. Um, and it'll have like a .NET client. This could be an Android client, Java, doesn't matter. A lot of the code will be very similar. What I don't have time to show you how to do is this last part. I did it today, but when I finally rehearsed it, it took too long. But I have this other HTTP client where I do a RESTful call against it, and it itself does a RESTful call against the National Weather Service, gets an XML document back about the weather, scans through that XML document, packages it up, only the stuff that is relevant for my client app, and sends it back. So I won't get to the second part, but at least I can show you this lame chat application right now. So I'm going to cancel out of this guy and bring up lame chat. So this is the kind of the demo that Ryan walks through on his uh, demo. So I'm just going to start pasting parts of this in. What does it tell you when you see this net here? Last time it was HTTP. What does net mean? 
TCP. So I'm creating a TCP uh, server here. I also have an array of sockets that I'm going to maintain. So every time a client connects, I'm going to record that socket so that I can broadcast future messages to that socket. So what I'm going to do after that now, of course, is try to open up uh, the uh, server. And there you can see the socket that got sent in. When a client connected, a socket was created. What do I need to do with that socket is I need to add it to an array and then later I'm going to write to it once I get a client to send a message. I'm going to basically broadcast to all my sockets every time I receive a message. So that's this next piece right here. Whoops, let me just uh, fix that typo. So let's go to this next piece of code. So what I just added in here now was the uh, code for the server um, method. So notice over here, as soon as I get a new socket, I'm going to add it to that array you see on line 7. So I'm, like I said, I need to keep a list of all my sockets that are open. So here you can see the data event. The data event is when, it, when a client sends some text. So in a chat application, it would be a message. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop through all my, all my sockets and on line 24, you can see that I'm writing to each one of the sockets. Lines 21 and 22 is, don't send the message to myself. Right? If I'm running a client app, I don't need to see my own outgoing messages. And then finally, when someone disconnects, that generates an end event, and we're going to go into our array and get rid of that socket, because it's otherwise a dead socket once someone disconnects. So the next kind of step at this point here is to actually engage um, this thing to listen. So I'm going to go here to the very bottom and plug in uh, my listen method. So here it's listening on port 8000. So great, we've got ourselves a, um, a uh, server-side chat application. So I'm going to go here and fire this guy off. So now it's waiting for my, for my client. So let me fire up Visual Studio and just create a quick little client application here. Again, this could be an Android. If you love writing lots of code, you can do it in Objective-C as well. So I'm going to do a WPF application. And this is similar to Android to the extent that there's a markup XML file where it's all kind of declarative for the user interface. And then there's a code behind. So I'm just going to go over here and build my user interface like really, really quickly here. The fastest user interface ever built. There it is. You can see I have a connect button over here. I have a, a, a kind of a name button for whoever it is that connects. I have the conversation text box. You can see that here. I've got an outgoing message text box and a send message command as well. So that's my user interface. Um, what I want to do next is just the code behind that, that does all the work for this. So for example, when I click Connect, this code's going to fire off over here. So what I want to do first is add some of these using statements, which kind of simplify my, uh, my writing of code. It just abbreviates a few things. I'm going to declare some variables here that will allow me to, to do a TCP conversation from within C Sharp. So I'm going to paste in a few of those variables. Notice I got a TCP client. And this server stream acts as my where I'm writing and reading from. So when people are chatting, when, when this client is chatting, it's sending outgoing text through the server stream. And when it receives text, it gets it here. So let's now code up the rest of this um, connect method over here. And let's walk through some of this code. So the connect is pretty simple. It's going to go over here and um, display the prompt. It's then going to go and connect to that waiting application that's sitting right here, port 8000. And it's going to basically go and get a handle to the stream so it can talk to the world. And it's going to basically say to everyone else who's listening, hey, someone just joined the conversation. It's just going to write out hey, Bruno's joining the conversation. This is like a thread that just loops in the background. And this thread, essentially, is just reading bytes. As Soon as it reads a byte, it adds it to the text box. 
with add message. And add message just goes to my conversation text box, right? It's just going to this guy right here and um, adding that text to it. And so pretty much when I send a message, it's just the same thing as before except in reverse. We're writing, we're not reading. So again, this loop here loops indefinitely as a th separate thread reading, and this little send button here sends messages. So I believe pretty much this, this client is done. Um, I'm going to um, compile it. I'm going to go over to the actual um, folder where this guy lives and fire him off. Let's do one more. So I'll just say whatever Jim here, I'll connect, and then I'll connect this guy, and he's having the conversation. Hello to me. Pretty much Node's brokering that conversation. Now, one of the things I was going to do if I had more time, I was going to have you type in a zip code here. Then it was going to go to the National Weather Service, or it was going to go to another Node application, send that zip code. That Node application was going to do a restful call to the National Weather Service, get XML, parse out temperatures, and then send that to all the clients through the other running Node application. But I'm out of time. It's kind of time's up. So I am going to just wrap up with uh, a couple little like uh, to-dos for you guys. So let's do that real briefly. So I strongly encourage you to go to the Node Package Manager. Now if you notice, I used, a, I, I used a bunch of them. And the way this works is you simply go to your command prompt over here. Let me do that. And you type in npm install. And let's say you want to play with URLs. You type that. And then it goes in. Boom, you're installed. Now in your code, you can just say require URL. So if you go up to the website, you're going to see a bunch of different modules. In fact, tonight we're lucky enough to have one of the creators here, the request module. He wrote this one. So if you go to the uh, npsjs.org site, you'll see these are, the, these are the libraries you guys should all use. So as a follow-up, and this is on my blog, go and start playing with these. That's how I kind of, I've only spent a few days on Node, and it was amazingly easy. So again, you can go and install underscore, for example, and just uh, before you do that, however, you have to install the Node Package Manager. So go over to npmjs.org over here. The distribution folder I found is the easiest way to do this. And get the zip and then just unzip it. At that point, you have the Node Package Manager installed, and you can say npm install underscore, and you're off and running. Now, what does this guy do? Why underscore? Well, our code tends to get gummed up. And so what these guys came in and said, hey, why don't we give functional programming capabilities to Node applications? And functional languages kind of minimize the, the notion of a state. They're not as procedural compared to imperative languages. So a lot of big fans over there for it. And if you take a look at, say, just underscore itself, it's got examples for all these categories of functions. So think of it as a general framework to kind of make you a better node programmer in a functional kind of way. So that's just one example of all the modules that you can get. And again, we have a, a, one of the speakers tonight. Michael's going to talk to you about request, which is an extremely powerful and popular one here. And that's my time, everyone. Thanks for, uh, for showing up. Thanks for listening to me. I'm going to pass the baton to Mr. Matt Harrington. Thanks, everyone.